Okay, so real quick, there's not going to be footage for Film Red in this video. I don't know how risky that would be, but I'm not trying to risk that yet, so it's going to be video game play for the entirety of the video. With spoilers for One Piece Film Red ahead, although by this point, it's been out for long enough, you know, spoilers are probably to be expected in something like this. Film Red is the first musical I've watched in a long time, and I loved almost every second of it. Going into the movie, I didn't quite realize exactly what it would be. I saw the trailers and the promotional art, and I constantly listened to the songs Otto was posting, but I just thought it was going to have an incredible soundtrack, which it did. I didn't realize that the soundtrack was going to be integral to the experience and blend so well with the story itself. Perhaps the giveaway should have been how much Uta herself was promoted as part of the movie, but I guess I didn't think about that leading up to the release of the film. I would describe Film Red as pioneering the subgenre of musical shonen, because the musical comes first and foremost to the story, before any of the fighting. And there were fights, but maybe fewer than I might have expected, even out of a One Piece movie. Uh, Uta even sings while she's fighting off wannabe kidnappers the Straw Hats engage with early on in the movie. These early songs are poppy and peppy and fun. The upbeat, idle energy is what one might expect out of a diva literally named song or singing in Japanese. That said, as fun as these songs were, I was wondering when the ball of the plot was going to get rolling. That was until I realized the ball had already started rolling down a cliff, much like Luffy and Bartholomew do in a later scene in the film, and they just kind of roll around, and it's a good time. The upbeat, energetic music in the first part of the film is traded in for much heavier and louder music moving into the second part of the movie. The big, huge super spoilers to stop listening here now if you want to avoid it, twist where it establishes the antagonist as none other than Uta herself, I thought was pretty great. And as we see her lose her sense of direction over the course of the film, the music grows more and more aggressive. The songs become heavier and louder towards the middle as Uta's determination to save everyone grows. She lashes out at those she feels wrongs her, and acts in blatant disregard for anyone's safety, including her own, which reoccurs several times throughout the film. This escalated until she is attacking even those who fully supported her, until she reveals her true colors, causing them to question her judgment. Eventually, the music switches some of the aggression out for uh, more melancholy songs to, to offset the sense of danger with one of sadness, as Uta fights against the years of anger she's built up, not only at Shanks, but also at herself. Uta is not evil, but she is a tragic antagonist. She genuinely wanted to change the world for the better, and made potentially millions of people happy in the process of making her music that she was enjoying. However, years of building existential dread and nightmarish knowledge took their toll on her. Uta is a broken person. She is cheery and happy, and loves nothing more than making her friends and fans happy too, which makes her grip on her own aggression all that much looser as she appears smiling despite her mounting rage. At the beginning, she's composed, but as more and more people challenge her, she's forced to wrestle with her own conflicting thoughts and has to question if she's really doing the right thing, making her reason switch between happy and enraged. She, at least for a while, genuinely believed taking people's souls to another world would be a better alternative to the one they lived in. When pushed back against, she shut down and refused to listen to anything or believe anything other than seeing things in black and white. If you're not with me, you're against me. And I, I think this is kind of seen in... It, you could make a fun comparison to piano keys and the scales being shown in black and white keys with some more of the musical elements of this film because it is chocked full of musical imagery. 
Uh, Uta would have killed on a scale unseen in most shonen, let alone One Piece, in an instant. And for a while, she almost succeeded. Dragon Ball notwithstanding, because you know, they're blowing up planets whenever they feel like it for just no reason half the time. Sometimes just to send a message, sometimes because they're showing off power. And it kind of rules, because hell yeah. Uh, then again... Almost succeeding is kind of how Shodan give their stakes. The antagonist is getting close to winning. They're about to be everyone. I, I mean, even more than Shonen, media just does that. The stakes are the highest when the antagonist is about to win, on the cusp of victory. Anyone who heard Uta's song had their soul pulled into the Sing Sing world, where Uta had control over almost every aspect. Her power is not total control, uh, over the world of the Sing Sing Fruit, or there wouldn't have been a movie. For the most part, it follows the rules that most Paramecia-type Devil Fruits have. If she can touch it, she can use her powers on it. In the real world, the conduit for this is her singing, so sound rather than direct touch, but there are plenty of Paramecia that operate on kind of similar levels. Uta is basically a siren, her song is alluring and shows people what they want to see, most often hope, which became a double-edged sword as Uta pushed herself to become what people wanted, a savior. Within the concert venue itself, Uta is able to give food and drink and presents and anything to make people happy freely, and they fly around like and they fly around the arena delivered to the fans that are sitting around listening to the concert and she flies around like a bird on two-toned wings because she just decides to grow wings for a little bit and looks very similar to a character styling we see later in one piece uh, that i'm not sure has shown up in the anime but it has in the manga and it's very interesting she even beats several sets of pirates on her own, adding to her appeal. These people are looking up to her as someone who's going to revolutionize the world, bring about the end of the great pirate era, and bring in an age of prosperity. And to see their idol up there on the stage, cranking 90s and beating up dudes is a great boon to her. It boosts her appeal and the hope that people feel in her. But, like a siren, the result of being drawn in is death, and should Uta's plan have succeeded, that would be the result. It's a grim show of her resolve that she had been eating wake shrooms for hours at the bare minimum before the concert began. She was suffering under the effects of these mushrooms' poison long before her fans would have pulled, been pulled into the Sing Sing world by her song. There was also the chance that the white shrooms aren't poisonous themselves, and it's more that prolonged periods of not sleeping is what kills the consumer due to exhaustion. But then Uta would have been eating them for days at least in order for them to kill her after or during the concert. That said, the fact that Sanji threw out the mushrooms early on in the film suggests to me that it's the former. A mushroom that is just poison and also keeps you awake wouldn't exactly qualify as food, but a mushroom that, in small quantities, is safe to eat and just keeps you awake, something like that would serve well as a snack, especially for a concert, and especially when the Straw Hats are supposed to be acting as staff. Sanji wouldn't throw away something that's considered food. We see that across his character arc any episode he is in. Throwing away food is not something he would even consider, even if he didn't want to cook with it at that very moment. And I just thought that was kind of a fun way to set a little bit of a teaser of what happens later in the film with the reveal of what the wake shrooms are doing to her versus the start of the film when we see Sanji first find one of these and pick them up and then throw it away in the garbage because seeing Sanji throw away something that was in a pile of food they were cooking was baffling for a moment it was bonkers it is interesting to note that Uta's control over the Sing Sing world kind of felt like it varied and wasn't fully consistent throughout the movie. 
I guess it grows the deeper into the movie we go. When searching for Luffy, she had soldiers seeking them out from the sky that she created with her powers, while the mob looked with her on the ground below. And this mob just being a lot of people from the concert. I don't know if it was everyone, but it sure was a lot of people. Later, she's able to transform people at will into dolls and toys, and she does so in a deluge of water that floods the entire concert arena, and then eventually, what looks like the entire world, or at least the arena, or the area surrounding the massive concert venue. The entire fight against Uta takes place in a dreamlike landscape, where the ground reflects light and ripples like water until she makes a deluge that hurts you and bubbles up from underneath or the sides. This makes gauging her strength difficult, but it's obvious she's a subject of shonen power scaling, very strong in her own right, and her growing control, and then lack there thereof, could be explained by her approaching death. Uta dying means everyone would be trapped in the Sing Sing world, and it seems to suggest that they would stay there and not disappear into any sort of afterlife. I, we don't really know too much about the afterlife in One Piece, but we know people die sometimes, occasionally, very rarely. The accuracy of that is hard to say because we never see that happen because... They beat her. They, the good guys win. Surprise. Spoilers. But her use of greater power could be evidence of that, or simply her lack of desire to keep appeasing those she thought she wanted the approval of. I think it's also important to note that power scaling in One Piece is at best difficult and at worst reductive. Characters from previous arcs come back as strong as the main cast members, or at least showing similar levels of growth from where they were previously. Others will be leagues ahead, leagues ahead, then still far surpass most others in strength, even after gaps in their appearance, because they were just that strong to begin with. The people who are trying to claw their way to the top of this world are constantly growing in power, and not just in the I punch better now strength either. They make allies, or develop new skills, or develop as a character, and push what they can do to make it to whatever level they need to be for them to be relevant to the plot. Yes, One Piece does have some of the typical trappings of shounen anime, but it has far more going on than simply uh, you know what? You're stronger now. Congrats. Backtracking a bit, the movie illustrates that skill with one's power is more important than raw strength, because Uta physically couldn't take any of the Straw Hats or Marines in a fight either. Yet, she damn near brings the entire world to its knees because of how she uses her power. This battle against her in the dream world turns to a nightmare when Uta summons Tot Musica, a demon lord who has been sealed away long ago inside a sheet of music. Or several sheets of music. This has to be the most overt reference to anything spiritual in One Piece, and there's literally stuff called Devil Fruits and a guy called the Sun God Nika. We've heard mentions of deities and the like in other places, but they were as cultural elements rather than as something that is direct and no a noticeable impact on the world, except for Anil, but he was just more of a guy with a god complex. Totten Musica is a monstrosity that towers above buildings, and it is built like a one-man band with multiple arms made of twisted piano keys. I'm not a huge fan of how Stampede handled its finale, with Douglas just kind of turning into a big ol' CGI monster with his awakened devil fruit, absorbing all the weapons and buildings even, and stuff around them. But Top Musica felt much more natural in its existence as a big huge guy they needed to hit, even at first hitting was doing nothing. A bit of a side note though, or I guess relevant to the comparison to Douglas, three all three of the last One Piece movies have kind of had the finale be against a guy who is huge monster in size, and I am a little tired of it. Guild Tessero's gold mech man was really cool and let Luffy show off Gear Fourth's big punch power, but Douglas Bullet doing the same thing just kind of felt worse. 
and like they wanted to do something dramatic for the big screen that I don't know, I guess it kind of detracted from the previous fights against him being so incredibly cool. E even when he just got in his robot. Douglas going hand-to-hand -hand with the entire worst generation? Sick as hell. Douglas in his ship mech thing? Sure, I guess that's neat. It was fun. Showing off his awakened paramecia sounded rad. Unfortunately, it was kind of just a blob guy. It kind of looks like a season one pretty cure Zakenna. And is this a problem exclusively made so every character in the film can get hits in and feel relevant? Maybe so. The One Piece has big casts, especially in the movies. And all of the cast gets to play a part in defeating Tot Musica. Every single named character who is present gets part of the scene and combo attack. Not only that, but while most of the cast are stuck in the dream world fighting Top Musica there, a few other characters are in the real world fighting him too. The combination attacks are twice as difficult to land because they have to coordinate between two worlds because they're only able to damage Top Musica if they hit him simultaneously in both. It's a bit of an odd weakness to have, but considering the origin of this demon as one of song with piano keys for limbs, it's not that surprising or confusing. Every note has to play together in unison, natural notes working with sharps and flats. These two hands moving back and forth is how music is made, and how a music-inspired monster is unmade. And I thought it was a really cool element of design, that is then incorporated into the fight. The flow of the attacks pick up dramatically as Usopp and, incredibly, his father, Yasop, work in unison to direct their allies in cooperative attacks until the two are shouting the locations to hit simultaneously while the film builds toward the triumphant, fi triumphant final strike. The I do wish, however, that we got even some sort of conversation between them that went beyond simply addressing one another. This is, to my knowledge, the first time we've seen Usopp and his father interact at all in the series, and even if they made mention of wanting to catch up but not having the time at the current moment, I think that it would have been much better than nothing when we got the conversation of Usopp realizing he could use his hockey to see through his father's eyes. I have to wonder if this variant ability of observation hockey will make an appearance at another point in the series, perhaps with a slight change to it to account for there probably not being an alternative overlapping world they need to be near to see into. Otherwise, this is probably going to stay a movie exclusive skill. It was incredible getting to see these two characters interact, considering they really haven't over the entire runtime of the series so far. The highlight was, obviously, Luffy and Shanks landing the final strike. Shanks is a character we do not get to see much at all in the series, despite being there from the start of it all. From the very first chapter, we rarely get to see combat featuring Shanks. In this scene, we see him live up to his status as one of the four or five emperors, with his blade rippling with conqueror's hockey. Luffy, too, shows off his incredible power that has only grown to new heights in recent arcs, as expected of our protagonist. This is also the first time we ever get to see Luffy's newest form animated. Year 4 is not the finisher in this movie for the first time. For the first time ever, Year 5 is used on screen, and what a shot it was. The animation in this movie is so fluid and the impact and styling of this part of the film was incredible to watch on the big screen, and I'm going to enjoy it even more when I get to watch it any time I want at home. I really, really want to pick up one of the Blu-rays of this so I can show other people this film. That said, I think the size of this cast plays to the movie's detriment at times. One Piece has an absolutely massive list of characters, and so many of them are included in the movies as of late. Even some of the notab notable characters who are not directly involved in the plot are included in several shots, like the Gorosei, who show up to comment on how dangerous the Sing Sing Fruit's power is, 
and then they don't really do anything else. Th there are a ton of major players who all conveniently happen to be at Uta's concert at the same time, who then have to work together in some capacity to escape from Uta and later beat her. I would estimate the named cast to be somewhere in the 30s, not including the new character made for this movie. That's a lot of characters to give screen time to, and once or twice I felt like there could have been a better character to give screen time to, someone who'd be more directly related to the plot. There were several scenes of this, with the assigned comedian cast, uh, that being a shrunk-down Beppo and Bluno, Chopper, and a tiny anthropomorphized Thousand Sunny running around dodging attacks and yelling, generally just being little goofballs. It was a little funny, but I don't know if it really mattered at all. It was weird that several of the characters were shrunk down to begin with, and it was clearly because of Uta's power, but it wasn't really ever explained why it happened to them specifically, or even addressed beyond somebody going, wow, what happened to you, before the scene moves on to something else. Then again, it's literally just a goofy anime, so it doesn't really matter if something like that is put in uh, for fun, for free, for the kids. It doesn't matter. It's weird, and it doesn't really have a point, but it doesn't drag the movie down because it's just a few scenes that barely take up any time. Also, I went back and watched it again between when I initially wrote this and when I have finished writing it, and since the movie is out on the Japanese Amazon video streaming, and the name's cast sits closer to 40, according to Behind the Voice Actors. Even more if you include the minor role section of characters who had maybe one speaking line, but still make an appearance, so they sort of count. So, yes, absolutely massive cast, as expected. Overall, I loved One Piece Film Red. It was such a fun movie, and somehow, despite knowing how huge the soundtrack was going into it, I didn't expect it to be quite as much of a musical as it turned out to be. More anime movies should do musicals, because this one was great, and the variety of musicians helping with the soundtrack really carried the film forward with stellar sound and atmosphere. With Uta expressing a variety of emotions through unique songs, the soundtrack never felt dull and always had something new to show. I had these songs playing for days, if not weeks, before the film, and I've had them playing for months after, and I will continue to turn up these tasty jams for quite a long time to come. Go watch One Piece Film Red, buy the Blu-ray, show it to your friends, have them buy the Blu-ray, etc, etc. Anything to get more incredible films like this made. It was a joy to watch, and I enjoyed getting to watch it several times, and I've enjoyed getting to talk about it.